Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Welcome back, everybody. I'm going to pull back a little bit. There we go. Went slightly less fat. No, believe me, buddy. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you about a story about that off the air. But uh, mm-hmm. about me being fat, I was at the supermarket and had to argue about the salad bar. And wow. the last thing any store manager wants to hear is a fat guy complaining about food. Let me guess, sir. Not enough food for you. <laughs> welcome back to Word Balloon, everybody. John Suntress here. Always happy to welcome Matthew Clickstein back to Word Balloon. Good to see you, man. Thanks for having me, John. I really appreciate it. A hundred percent, dude. I've been talking about. Uh, Matthew's projects regarding the history of San Diego Comic Con. I put the hyphen back in just for Matthew. Yay! <laughs> uh, and uh, now we are just weeks away from the debut of Matthew's book, See You at San Diego, an oral history of Comic Con fandom and the triumphs of geek culture. Stand by, I'm going to take it out. There you go. You can wave the book. Look how thick that book is, everybody. It is, it, in case people don't believe me, it is a big, thick friggin phone book of a book it's over 500 pages and a lot a lot a lot of time a lot of energy a lot of frustration went into it but we're really proud of it and um you know john you were nice enough to have me on the show uh a while back and we talked about uh you know the, the podcast series and that was really fun and we talked about it at terrific con uh just a couple of weeks ago as well along with the book so um you know it's it's been an ongoing process for the last few years getting to this point so <laughs> uh right away chris conley wants to know was that frank zappa with jack kirby you know what's funny is not the first person to ask that uh it's the gentleman uh, right there that he's wondering about uh no it's a gentleman named jeff gelb and um a lot of people do think it's frank zappa but it's jeff gelb he was a radio uh, DJ and show host in San Diego, one of the many people back in the 70s and early 80s, um, and I think a little bit longer than that as well, who helped get the word out about San Diego Comic-Con back in the day. I had actually talked to him a few times, very nice guy, uh, when we were putting the podcast series together. The book is something of an expansion on um, way back in the, in the beginning of all this. Uh, he, uh, you know, he said good luck with it, but he didn't feel it was his story to tell, as he put it. So uh, he didn't want to be in the podcast or the book, um, but he's been a really nice, supportive guy. And he was really happy to see that he was in the picture uh, on the cover. So uh, and Gary Groth, our, our publisher over at Fanographics, was nice enough to send him a coffee, a, a coffee, a copy. Sorry. Long day. Um, so, yeah, Jeff Gelb is who that is. Radio DJ. <laughs> Absolutely. So not uh, young Gene Shalit, the old uh, no. NBC movie critic, not Frank no, Zappa. Not critic, was right? was Jeff Gelb um, an FM DJ or was he a top 40 pop hit DJ? Do you know? Um, I, you know what? Good question. Um, I think he was FM um, because I, I believe it was it was rock. You know, it's funny. I, 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 I haven't asked him or anyone else that yet. He comes up a few times in the book. Um, as does another radio DJ who I believe might have been at the same station, uh, Gabriel Wisdom, who was another guy. Who, awesome name. There yeah, you go. A, a big supporter of Comic-Con back in the day. He apparently looked like and would dress up like Thor and would actually come and do things at Comic-Con. And funny story there, um, uh, and, and this is one of the stories that's one of my favorites, both in the podcast and, and actually extended in the book which is that uh, there was a, a celebrity criminal who was being uh, jailed uh, in San Diego uh, in the 70s. And um, his name was Timothy Leary, Dr. Timothy Leary. I'm sure a lot of people on this uh, listening right now and watching uh, know who that is. Uh, the acid guru, uh, known at the time as the most dangerous man in America, according to Richard Nixon. Um, and he had just gotten out of jail and apparently was a fan of Gabriel Wisdom's show and ended up literally coming right from the prison to the radio station, had his parole officer with him, everything is the way the story goes. And it just so happens it was right around when Comic-Con was happening and a couple of the Comic-Con reps were there to kind of plug the the, the uh, convention and they thought it might be a good idea to ask uh, Dr. Leary if he would uh, come and be a special guest at the con. Uh, wow. So in 1976, and we have a picture of it of, 
Dr. Timothy Leary, programming director at the time, Dave Scroge, who would go on to also help Dark Horse really get going, um, and George Clayton Johnson, a habitué at Comic-Con over the years, who's done so many different things from Twilight Zone to Star Trek to co-writing Logan's Run, even the original Ocean's 8, uh, Ocean's 11. Um, he, uh, there's a picture of them all together, and it's a great picture, uh, but Timothy Leary did show up as a special guest at Comic-Con in 1976, and it was just because of this odd connection of them at the right time, place at the right time, yeah. Some of the older comics folks didn't particularly like the idea of Timothy Leary being there, so there was a little bit of a protest about it, so they kind of had to keep it a little bit covert, but um, ultimately- Hilarious. There. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Well, and again, I love the FM radio connection, and also, and it is kind of a little surprising that that was the reaction to Dr. Leary because that said, as you well know, uh, and I've always loved this, Frank Miller always says that comic books are an out, were and still are an outlaw medium. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, like rock and roll was, like jazz was, and especially as jazz evolved into 50s, cool jazz and everything. Um, and And yeah, that's, I mean, Comic-Con now is so mainstream. It really is our combination of, you know, uh, the, uh, the you know, your favorite uh, film festival in Disneyland, essentially. But, <laughs> We're putting it, actually. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, it literally was birthed in the back of head shops and by these hippies that love nerd shit and are like, hey, we all ought to get together. And, uh, and I, I just love that about San Diego. And you can find it. The DNA is still there. Yes. But these days you got to look hard for it. Yeah. Uh, that's something that came up both in the podcast and definitely in the book. Um, even people, one of our celebrity guests uh, in, in both in the book. Well, I'll just keep talking about the book. The book's what we're talking about here. Well, I want you um, to. And while you are, I'm going to even put up while we're talking about it. Uh, we can look up uh, some amazing images. Yeah, but um, Al, Gene, Al Jean, a good friend of mine for many years now, <clears throat> who's been running The Simpsons since 2001, one of two people who's written for the show since it started, along with Mike Reese, very good friend of mine that I wrote a book about The Simpsons with, uh, Springfield Confidential. Um, uh, but Al uh, says in the book that, um, you know, the same thing, because Al is not only a creator of geek content with uh, the Simpsons, but he is a true blue geek himself. And in fact, used to go to comic cons, comic conventions in Detroit as a young boy. There's even a lot of stories about, and I've heard some back and forth on this, that, that um, Mr. Jeff Anderson, I, AKA comic book guy on the Simpsons is based loosely on their comic book guy at the comic book store that used to be down the street from where the, the writer's room is for the Simpsons on the, on the Fox lot. A few different people kind of mentioned that, although I've also heard, other stories but the point is uh al has said that you know he enjoys still going around even to comic-con um when he's gone over the last few years he didn't go this last this last year but when he has gone because he can still find some of those things that he's looking for that are those specialty items that might be a little harder to find and he is able to get that um and i think my favorite story like that that i think is a good example of what we're talking about is barry alfonso who's one of the people who literally helped to create Comic-Con is it was one of the first people to really put it together with the rest of the, the team when he was a mere 12 years old, by the way, um, and not, you know, getting coffee. He was helping to run it. Um, but he said that uh, in, in one of the last few years that he went with his wife, they found a room where people were doing a read around of some little Lulu comics. And as he says, you know, you can't imagine something more hardcore and nerdy than a bunch of people standing around in a room reading little Lulu comics. And that's going on also at the same San Diego Comic-Con where there's all these big stars and Hall H and everything else. So you're 100% right, John. And I think that's one of the cool things about San Diego is that though, you know, some people feel it's been co-opted, though some people feel it's gone too mainstream, it certainly has become more difficult for older folks to go comfortably. It's very crowded. It's very expensive. There are a lot of reasons that it makes it harder for a lot of people, you know, who want to just enjoy the comics and the older sci-fi stuff to go. That stuff is still there. And it is definitely still a part of Comic-Con. Yeah. And, you know, there really is still something for everyone there, even if you're not so into the larger scale mainstream stuff. Um, and, you know, everyone has made that very clear. Even some of the people who don't particularly care for Comic-Con as much as they used to, they say, well, there is still that stuff going on and it's still worth going for that. Uh, even for the more hardcore kind of vintage folks. So, 
Well, and you know, honestly, Matthew, and I think I've told you this before, I started going in 2006. And obviously, the way it's grown since then is ridiculous. But yeah. That was that, really when a lot of the changes started happening. You got there like right at the transition. Well, but then again, and we'll get back to that. But honestly, I always bring back the uh, the program, which is a nice size. I mean, and actually, I'm waiting for the day that they stop printing a physical program and they make you look everything up on your phone on an app or something like that. But that said, it's like this thick. Yeah. And every day, because people are like, well, Comic-Con isn't about comics anymore. And I would point out 10 panels from 10 in the morning till midnight that absolutely were comic book panels. And I'm like, you're wrong. I go, the reason why you think that is, first of all, you've never gone. Yeah. Secondly, you're getting CNN's feed of Comic-Con. Right. Where USA Today, where yeah. the focus is on Hall H and the television announcements and the film announcements. And it's like, yes, of course all that's happening. But the important thing to remember is these guys didn't forget where they came from. And uh, not only that, but I, as I've told you before, too, my favorite kind of hidden room where some amazing panels are happening about comic book history is uh, they always quarter off this one private room where all the academics that are writing for their PhDs about pop culture. And that's where the Tencent Archie came from and some other great books in, in recent years. And it's like, oh, did you know that in the aftermath of World War II, in Stars and Stripes, there was a regular daily comic strip mm -hmm. about a Japanese woman, and this was in occupied Japan, and it was about the normalization of Japan after the war. And it's like, no, I did not know that. And it's like, well, this was the artist, and here's the story, and here's several panels. And it's like, you learn. I mean, and again, you've got to hunt for it. But it's there, and if it Comic Con is what you want it to be, if you want yeah. nothing but anime and manga, you're covered. If you right. want nothing but Hall H, you're covered. But if you really want these tidbits of comic book knowledge that only happen at San Diego, that's how you find it. Yeah, and, and I think it's important too, John. I feel like we might have talked about this a little bit in the past, um, but one of the big themes of my story here, as told by the people who quite literally created Comic-Con and, and some of the larger, more iconic folks over the years, like Neil Gaiman and Kevin Smith and others who uh, were in the podcast and in the book. Um, the, the One of the, the overarching stories is the big secret. Well, I don't know if it's a secret, but the big tell is Comic-Con was never just about comics ever. Uh, it was always from day one, even the little mini con that they had, at uh, the very beginning before the the first official uh you know before it was even really called comic con but the, before the, the the first what's considered the first one they did a, a fundraiser um you know it wasn't just about comics it was always also about movies and animation and television and certainly science fiction uh you know we're talking about ray bradbury we're we're talking about again george clayton johnson um you know people forget frank capra was at one of the first comic cons uh, they had Chuck Norris as early as 1975. It's Comic-Con 6 talking about Bruce Lee. Um, we have some great stories of one of the things that people used to love to come to Comic-Con for back in the early days before there was VCRs and before there was cable television was the movie screenings that they would have. And they'd have them running the entire time because it was a bunch of AV nerds and uh, for the most part. <laughs> And people who literally worked at movie theaters and the like and would pull these great films from the archives. And it was everything from old Superman serials and Flash Gordon serials and the like to there's some really fun stories we have of a particularly infamous screening of Beyond the Valley of the Dolls that they had. Oh, my. Um, again, you know, watching watching old, you know, watching Bruce Lee and Kung Fu movies, which also kind of makes sense. When I talk to people who aren't as familiar with the scene and explain that martial arts and Bruce Lee and Kung Fu movies was a big part of the Comic-Con scene. It makes sense if you think about it, because that's the closest thing we have, aside from professional wrestlers, which also started becoming a bit a part of the scene, especially at the Chicago cons, because they're the closest thing we have to superheroes. That's Bruce right. Lee is like a real life superhero was before he passed. And so, you know, the same people that are into comic, comic books and superheroes and even science fiction and magic and all these things, they loved those films and they loved Bruce Lee. And indeed, there were magicians there and there was a lot of love for Harry Houdini and they would actually have professional ma magicians come. They would have people who were doing yo-yo tricks and things. I mean, it was the, the point of Comic-Con and, and I've talked with a few different people about this. 
there's almost sometimes with certain people, not remorse or regret, but almost a sense that maybe they shouldn't have even called it Comic-Con to begin with. They should have called it something like Pop Culture Con, although that wasn't really a term back then. Um, you know, where a lot of this came from, for people who are familiar with the story, of course, is the guy who was pretty much considered the founder of Comic-Con, Mr. Shell Dorf, who passed away in 2009. He really got the idea for a lot of what they ended up doing and what Comic-Con became from something he was helping with in Detroit called the Triple Fanfare. And it was called the Triple Fanfare because it wasn't just comics. It was comics and movies and animation. And that really was a big part of the early days of Comic-Con, especially, again, you know, June Foray and, and Chuck Jones and Dawes Butler. I mean, and that just makes sense if you think about it. Cartoons and animation was a huge part of the early years of Comic-Con and still is. So it was never just about comics. And, I, you know, one of my other favorite stories and something I find really interesting is, you know, these conversations that go on about, oh, you know, Comic-Con's just gone to Hollywood now and it's just about the TV shows, the movies, or, you know, a few years back when there was some controversy about is Twilight taking over? Why is Twilight here? Yada, yada, yada. That's also been going on since at least as early as 1973, Comic-Con 4, when they had a special area just for Star Trek. There was a special area just for Star Trek. And for a few years thereafter, and you can hear this in some of the recordings that are out there, especially through Mike Towery, another co-founder of Comic-Con's uh, great website, Comic-Con Memories, which I recommend to everybody. You can literally hear some of the old panels. You can hear people complaining and talking about, is Star Trek taking over Comic-Con? And what's all this about? Why, why is Star Trek here? And just like you said uh, before, John, about Part of it now, the, the complaint is because CNN and a lot of the press just focuses on that element, the movie and television element yep. of Comic-Con. So that's all a lot of people outside the world know about Comic-Con. It was the same thing back then. A lot of people that were within Comic-Con were upset that a lot of the media was only focusing on the Star Trek people because of their spiffy costumes and because they were kind of, you know, the, the freaky freaks and doing this, that and the other. And it was very telegenic and it was something to kind of show a certain element of comic-con that a lot of especially the local media wanted to show and that upset a lot of the other comic-con people so these kinds of discussions have been happening for the last 50 years nothing nothing about that is new yes hall h changed a lot yes the internet changed a lot yes it's certainly much bigger the hollywood influence than it was before and we certainly have people like my my another good friend of mine for many years lloyd kaufman of trauma who has some yes. great stories about, you know, Trauma and Lloyd and to the Toxic Avenger and Sergeant Kabuki Man were some of the first early, you know, Hollywood, although they're as far from Hollywood as you can get, but with the movie type people there at Comic-Con in the early days. And that, you know, that worked and Toxic Avenger is a comic book hero, you know, hero basically, even though he's a movie star and everything else. But Lloyd has talked about how over the years they got kind of pushed more and more to the side for those bigger blockbuster movies. And so even some of the film people who were there in the early years kind of bemoan and lament the fact that they're being shoved aside for, you know, the big Marvel movies and whatnot. So that that's both both are true. There's certainly a lot more yeah. Hollywood impact, but it's all it's been there since day one, really, in a way. So I get it, man. And no, you're right. And it's I'm glad you mentioned Star Trek because it and you can see it in the book. It's and also um the wonderful uh, Comic Comic Con Begins audio uh, series that you made for XM Series that's available as a podcast. More than eight hours, everybody, of incredible interviews and content. Brig Stevens, uh, the wonderful widow, widow, sadly of uh, Dave Stevens, and of course, <laughs> part of the original group putting the show on, and also uh, a great Vampirella as well. But um, the the ire about Twilight from 15 years ago same vibe as what the star trek people were getting in the early 70s i'm going to put up a comment really fast because as peter Beiser points out he says my wife and i finally did our first san diego last month a blast definitely summer camp for uh, adults came home with a million stories i always say yes it's really expensive summer camp because all, <laughs> all of our out-of-town friends we, we all get together we're having a blast yeah. we're blowing a couple grand <laughs> for the week and it's like it is what it is enjoy yourself and i i've missed the last couple of years i think 2017 or 18 might have been the last time that i went and i am itching to get back but by the same token it's like i can't mortgage the house 
just to go to Comic Con. No, it, 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 that is one of the unfortunate realities of Comic Con these days is that it is so incredibly popular. It is so incredibly big uh, that it's you know expensive to get tickets. For anybody who doesn't live in the area, especially this last year, I mean, it was one of the reasons, unfortunately, I myself wasn't able to make it out. Uh, we didn't really have books available yet. I, I learned later, actually, that Fanagraphics had, I think, a whopping, literally, I think it was like six, just to kind of show around. But a big part of why I myself didn't go was I just couldn't afford it because and a lot of it was just the plane fare alone. Um, people might, you know, they're probably already forgetting, hopefully, but you know, uh, gas prices were like peaking right then. I mean, that was when it was, you know, six or seven dollars a gallon out here where I am in Ohio. And I and I heard tell that in California in some places it was as high as eleven or twelve dollars a gallon. And obviously that I was also impacting things like, you know, plane fare and whatnot. So there was just no way that I was going to be able to get out there, especially since for those who are in Southern California and are interested in all this, um, I am going to be doing a tour. Um, we can maybe talk about this a little bit more later, but yeah. um, first, the first uh, place that we're going to is L.A. Um, with some of the old Comic-Con folks and a few other special guests for a panel. We're going to be showing um, Scott Pilgrim, one of the great geek culture movies the last few years through the American Cinematheque and Los Feliz, doing a signing at Skylight Books. Uh, that all starts September 8th. More information on my website and all that. And we can talk a little bit more about that later. But um the point of all that being that, um, you know, I, I knew I was going to be coming back to California two months later, so I didn't want to pay for the plane fare. But I'm not the only one. Again, a lot of older Comic-Con folks and a lot of other people I know, um, other geek fans and such like that who don't happen to live in California, um, you know, just they can't make it out because the plane fare is very expensive. The hotels, forget about it. Um, and, you know, not to mention some of the other uh, elements that make it really challenging. I mean, the traffic and the lack of parking and it's, it's insane. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, even sometimes for some of the special guests, it can be a little bit difficult um, just because, you know, it's, it's like, you know, a lot of people don't understand this, but even when you go to things like Sundance or the Cannes Film Festival, I mean, I literally have known people over the years who've gotten their films in a can or gotten their films in a Sundance. I mean, they literally cannot go or they can only go for a brief time and, and such, because even those big festivals don't always pay for everything. Right. It can be extremely expensive. Not to mention, and P.S., this is for people who, who want to check it out for next year or whatnot, you got to start getting your hotels and stuff like that now, because it's not just about the cost. It's about, you know, things get booked up. Availability, and absolutely. Insane. And, and like I said, I, I know for a fact, and I've had experience with this, it's no different than a Sundance or a Cannes Film Festival or whatnot. So there are these very specialty events or South by Southwest, um, you know, where where even if you have the money for it, you know, you have to get your tickets and you have to get your, you know, hotels and such like that, like, you know, very far in advance. Um, so it's 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 rough. And, you know, that's that's part of the issue. But I will also say that much like with the Grateful Dead concerts, that you don't have to go to Comic-Con to enjoy Comic-Con. You know, I, I know plenty of people who go to Comic-Con and never step foot into the convention center and just go to all the parties. And, you know, Comic-Con quite literally, if you've ever been, takes over downtown San Diego and then some. So you can go to certain restaurants and coffee shops and bars and all different places all over town that are doing Comic-Con things. And you might still see, you know, Neil Gaiman or Frank Miller or others, you know, out and about. Um, you know, maybe not as much these days, but the point is that, you know, you can go to San Diego during Comic-Con and not go to Comic-Con and still enjoy Comic-Con very well, much the way you could with like Grateful Dead concerts and such like that. Hang yeah. And there, and a lot of free stuff sure. that is there for you to see. Mm -hmm. And also even in the immediate downtown gas lamp area, there's a great art gallery that always features incredible original sure. covers and art and, um, uh, and celebrities, you're right, man. God, half the celebrities that I would run into, it was when they were leaving the convention and going back to the Hilton, the Omni, and some of these other gas lamp hotels. And there they are. And everyone's just kind of walking around. Uh, Doug Benson, the um, great alt comedian uh, who Doug loves movies, is one yeah, of his big yeah, podcasts. Yeah. And, of course, is a uh, known yeah. pot smoker. And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I'm I'm uh, sitting here uh, in my uh, legal state of Illinois, and I, I'm with Doug on that. But I remember him, he had um, a camera following him and a microphone, almost like a periscope, like attached to his back. And he's just walking through the crowd. And everybody's like, Doug, all right, man, how are you? And, and that's another thing, how, as you said, magicians and things were always part of Comic-Con. I love 
how comedy has become an important part of Comic Con from Conan O'Brien sure. doing his show in the gas lamp uh, district during the week of Comic Con to stand up shows happening outside and uh, and uh, surrounding uh, theaters and venues. And you're right, man. No, it is it is a happening. And I even had a friend, uh, a mother of uh, three, and her husband, and they were driving. She's like, you know, we were thinking about going through San Diego. Can we get tickets? I'm like, you can't get tickets, but do yeah, stop man. and hang out oh, because still go and and hang out and have a time. You're right about the comedy thing too. Um, uh, we we also were lucky enough to get Scott Ackerman uh, for the podcast and the book. And really, a big part of that was just you know. Um, Myself and some of the producers, certainly at SiriusXM, were just big fans, and we were excited to to get him involved. Just in general, I had no idea, but Scott is another one who is a, a dyed in the wool super geek. And in fact, he he's from Southern California and used to go to Comic Con um, when he was younger, uh, going back as early as I think 1985, wow. um, and was going to get you know his, his you know. Uh, to finish his collections of Fantastic Four and whatnot. Um, and over the years, I'm sure some people are aware of this, he has, in fact, become a comic book writer. And he's done some of the big series like X-Men and Spider-Man and others. Um, so he's true blue. Um, but, uh, uh, you know... Pat you know, Oswalt. Yeah. Brian, Brian, Oswald, Brian Posehn. Posehn. Brian Posehn and Scott would actually go together every year. And by the way, part of it was so that they could split the hotel costs because even yeah. time comedy people like Scott Ackerman and Brian Posehn, it's still very expensive for them. And Scott has another great story of he learned at a point, surprise, surprise, that if you're something of a celebrity as he is, you can more or less be kind of sponsored to go and do things for different brands and whatnot and panels yes. and such. And he said he did that for a few years, but honestly that he, and this is him saying it, that he disliked it so much because a lot of the panels were things he wasn't really that into, or they, okay. they didn't really go the way he wanted that. He, he didn't really want to do it anymore. Oh, wow. I, from what I understand, I don't think he goes anymore partly because of that, because it's just too expensive. And so even someone like, you know, as big a deal as Scott Ackerman, you know um, I, I don't want to speak for him. I, I don't know the last year or two, but uh, well, obviously not two years ago, that was COVID, but, um, it sounded like, you know, he's, he's kind of stepping away from it just because it's gotten too crazy to go, too expensive and, and everything else. But Scott's got some great stories in the book and, you know, just things like that. And also watching how it changed over the years, especially from the, per the perspective of someone who's something of a celebrity and kind of getting invited to some of the rooftop parties with Entertainment Weekly and such and kind of realizing, A, wow, Comic-Con's gone big and B, uh oh, <laughs> maybe this is getting too big. So you know, Scott had some great things to say about it that are in the book. That I'm, I'm glad we talked to him. He really just as fans, but it turned out he had a lot to say about Comic Con and and comic book culture and fan culture and being a geek and everything else. And it was really one of our favorite interviews in the end with Scott Ackerman. So, and if you don't know the name, everybody, Comedy Bang Bang is his big podcast. Producer of Mister Show, uh, so involved uh, with. Uh, the the current and really I would say the the comics the comedy scene for over twenty years but still very vital to he he, he actually co I believe he co-founded I know he was one of the people who was helping run it Earwolf which is another one of the big podcasts that's right networks that uh, that comedy bang bangs on and not to mention one of the things that is my favorite of his is he also co-created and would direct most of the episodes of Zach Galifianakis's Between Two Ferns that's and I'm right. pretty sure he directed the film. Um, but if you're a fan of Zach Galifianakis's uh, Beyond, you know, Between Two Ferns, which I think is probably the best YouTube show that's been on ever, um, that it was Scott Ackerman uh, helped to direct it and co-create it. And, and by the way, for a while, I don't even know if they still do it, but they were doing a show version, a television show version of Comedy Bang Bang that I, I used to watch religiously, especially the yep. first few seasons. And they are just fantastic. So okay. Scott's one of those Renaissance men. Um, who you know can write comics, can direct, can can write comedy, can do so many different things. It's very funny himself. Um, so it was it was great to talk with him. I would say uh, doing the interview with him was fantastic, especially since we were doing it over Zoom, and then you know we recorded the audio for the podcast series and then transcribed it for the book. Um, but I will say another one who really surprised me actually. And this was unfortunately a little later. We weren't able to get him for the podcast, but another good example of you never know was um, one of my other big heroes uh, since I was much younger, like so many people from my generation, was RZA from Wu-Tang. Um, and uh, really, I wanted to talk to him originally for the podcast, 
which by the way is called Comic Con Begins. It's free on all audio platforms, although we um, uh, produced it in, par in partnership with Sirius XM and Stitcher, um, which is the same thing now. Um, but uh, it's it's released on all audio platforms. Oh, but, yeah. Um, uh, I thought it'd be cool to talk to Riza about the interconnection between uh, comic book world and, and superheroes and, and hip hop it and did. all of what he does and whatnot with, you know, some of the uh, sort of using sort of, you know, uh, different names for themselves and that kind of thing. And, you know, you know, and, and, and so forth. And, you know, just references made and, and that kind of thing. But I especially wanted to talk to him again about um, Bruce Lee and martial arts films and so forth. I thought that would be kind of fun to get like a different angle on that. Well, after a year of trying, I finally it took me six of his representatives and a year of emails and phone calls. And they finally came back to me and they said, you know, he can do it now. Do you still want him? And I said, well, the podcast is coming gone, but we're doing a book now could we interview him and maybe use what he has for the afterward? And they said, sure. And so I got to do a zoom interview with Riza again, just a big, big hero of mine. And I really just wanted to talk to him. And I even told him the talking points would be what I just described, kind of the intersection between comics and hip hop and hopefully talking a lot about martial arts and Bruce Lee. He just started to monologue about Gene Roddenberry and Jack Kirby and, you know, he got pretty specific in a lot of these things. And at a point I actually said, you don't mind my asking, sir, do you consider yourself a nerd? And he not only did he agree, apparently he had just written something about it for Wired about himself as a nerd. And, you know, we worked to put together the afterward based on his interview. And I, I'm really proud of how it came together. And I know that he was as well, because, you know, it was someone that you might not necessarily expect would be into a lot of this stuff. And he had so much to say about it, very in-depth, very specific. And, you know, it was just so cool to be able to talk to him at all. But I'm, I'm really proud that we were able to get that afterward in the book from, you know, Riza from Wu-Tang. So um, you never, you, you really never know um, who's going to be, you know, a super fanboy or a super fangirl. Um, and, and I think that that's part of the story that's so cool. And it's one of the reasons I'm glad that we got him in the book, because I want to show that, this, that there's so many different kinds of people out there who might surprise you. You know, I had no idea that Scott Ackerman was such a big fan of Comic-Con and was, you know, wrote comic books until, you know, I, I interviewed him and we talked and I did some research for us. I just knew him from Beyond Two Ferns and your yeah. comedy Bang Bang. I knew him as a comedy guy and a writer for Mr. Show. Right. So, you know, it's awesome when you see those connections happen. 100% man. And uh, again, yeah, these, these connections, good Lord. I've, I've told the stories before. I'm not going to waste our time doing it in terms of hanging with Brian Posehn and Jerry Duggan, who now is obviously a major Marvel writer. But, uh, yeah, I mean, and literally, we're, we're all at the Omni, and Rick Remender, too, and we're all waiting for different people. And it's like, all right, let's talk Marvel. And we spent, like, 20 minutes just cracking up and everything. I want to show this picture, because look how young they are. And uh, there's Sergio Aragonis and the great Stan, Stan Sakai. They're both great and longtime friends. Uh, one of my favorite WonderCon memories was when it, the show was still in San Francisco, and it was – after the show was over Sunday night and uh, the three of us and a couple others are, are just sitting in the lobby all together, just swapping stories. And it was like one of my great delights. And uh, both of them are just lovely men, but that's the great thing. These nexuses, there's a picture that's in the book of, and I love this. And I'm like, Oh, why did this comic book happen? It's Carl Barks, the uh, very wonderful Disney comic book artist that we all love. Donald Duck artist with Bern Hogarth one of the great Tarzan artists. And it's like, I want to see the Donald Duck Tarzan crossover, please. <laughs> but that, and, or even as you mentioned, Ray Bradbury, 2006, got to meet Ray Bradbury and nice. uh, Ray Harryhausen. Sure. who were walking together very casually. We grew up together. They grew, they were, they're, they were childhood friends. Very you know, approachable. Corey Ackerman also. And yes. so, you know, these, a lot of these people were, were good friends with each other. And grew up and, you know, we look, we we have, I'm sure a lot of people listening and watching are familiar with who Phil Tippett is. And, you know, Phil Tippett was another one who was part of the gang back in the day. Um, and in fact, there's some great stories of the really early days when everyone was still at high school um, and folks like Scott Shaw and Roger Friedman and, and some of the other really early San Diego Comic-Con folks. Um, who wanted to do an adaptation of a Ray Bradbury short story and actually worked to try to make it happen with some old eight millimeter cameras and that kind of thing. And apparently, as the story goes, um, and Greg Bear and Dave Clark and some of the others, 
when they um, when they went to approach Mr. Bradbury about it, um, they uh, they learned that Phil Tippett had had already been there and wanted to do the same story. And so, and we have some great <laughs> pictures that I actually got through the archives at UC Riverside University of California at Riverside, and they have pictures um, at um, I believe it's Baycon, one of the the um, the, the Northern California uh conventions from 1968 i think it was might have been a little earlier of ray bradbury scott shaw phil tippett and i think it's either greg bear or dave clark all together and you know it's black and white they look so young um we have some other great pictures of phil tippett in the book that we got through greg bear um and his lovely wife astrid anderson of course the daughter of the great sci-fi writer paul anderson um, and Astrid's another one of the people who really helped to get cosplay going back in the day. It was very involved in um, uh, Star Trek fandom and that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, you have all these diff different people who have been there since the very beginning. P.S. I also just want to say um, the one good movie that I've seen this year so far, although I will say I like the Batman a lot more than I thought I would. But the one movie I have to recommend to everybody that you might not have heard of or seen is Phil Tippett's great film that took him almost over 30 years to make Mad God that finally has been released. And it is it is a remarkable film. It really is amazing. If you like movies, um, particularly like um, uh, Fantastic Planet um, and some of the more kind of art films, there's really there's no dialogue. There's there's not really any plot to speak of. It's it's almost like a much more hardcore version of the original heavy metal movie. Um, and all stop animation, and, and Phil, Phil did it himself. All the stop animation took him over 30 years to do it. But Mad God, it really is the one movie of the year so far um, for Good Girl that I thought was just remarkable. And everyone I've told to see it has agreed that it's an incredible film. Could not tell you what it's about. Um, it really is an art film, um, but it's beautifully done. The music is fantastic, and the animation is just incredible. Um, and if you're a fan of Phil Tippett, and for people who don't know who he is, although I imagine if so she's gotten this far in the game here, um, you know who he is. But, you know, he basically was the Ray Harryhausen from our 80s and 90s generation of films. I mean, he really was. It's, you know, after O'Brien and then it's Ray Harryhausen and then it's Phil Tippett. Um, everything from a lot of the the, the, um, the, the the machines and creatures and such in movies like Star Wars and later on Robocop. The Ed 209, he did a lot with Jurassic Park and, and still is working today. Um, so, you know, uh, see Mad God. And, you know, you can check out in our book stories about Phil Tippett, pictures of him. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get him for an interview um, at the time. I, you know, I, I, there was only so many people we can get. We got over 50 people. I was just so, saying, you did, you did pretty good, dude. You got well, a lot of great people. Phil's, Phil's a big part of the story, though. And, sure. it, you know, it's cool to have him in there in by proxy and a lot of people talking about him and, and how important he was to the scene and, and in, in my opinion still is with movies like mad god where he you know just just got released so um I, I wanted to point out the picture i've got up there now because as you say so many people have been involved with san diego forever and up there in the blue jacket and the white shirt that's mark evan uh and and you know again one of those original kids yep. that you know and and now is like the walter cronkite of <laughs> comic-con uh, moderators it, yeah. you know always does like a dozen panels over the five days and right below him the great george clayton johnson you mentioned his credits the twilight zone the first aired star trek episode the man trap logan's run oceans 11 this is the guy who wrote that stuff and i saw him at his last show uh and um my dear buddy andy parks was on the floor and i saw that he was doing a panel upstairs and i ran back to the main floor and i'm like andy i'm like george clayton johnson is upstairs we gotta meet him man come on and he's like you're right okay great thank you so we run up and george is like one of the as you well know one of the original beatniks i mean yeah. it really was like pre-hippie beat generation kind of uh um bohemian kind of guy and even as an elderly gentleman had this great asian hat that he wore he almost would have uh, been mistaken for an asian sage of some sort you if you didn't know who you were talking to so we go up now um this is about 10 years ago so i'm like 47 and andy's like 40 or whatever we walk up and we're like mr johnson can we please take a picture oh sure 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 so we pose and he's like well thank you boys it's really nice to meet you we're like boys we're middle-aged men and it's this <laughs> great so no, there's, I, there's a lot of stories about about George Clayton Johnson please. for many years and was a big big part of the scene there. Um and you know these are the kinds of people George Clayton Johnson 
Um, and uh, Jack Kirby, obviously, as you oh, said, yeah. Bark, uh, and, um, you know, Bob Clampett and, you know, Sergio, yes. uh, Sergio Aragones, obviously, who we actually interviewed for the book. And it's just fantastic. I actually He's still have one of the few saved voicemails I have on my cell phone is a, is one of the first voicemails I got from Sergio when I had first reached out to interview him just because I'm such a fan, but also because he's got such a, uh, a okay. interesting voice. Yeah. yeah musical voice. He really, 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 I know. I mean, and, and it's I beautiful. Man. No. I really, I have, I have his voicemails and I listen to it every now and then because I just love listening to him talk. He and was so, storytelling that night at WonderCon and yeah, man, no. And he told that great story about, he was an extra on the movie. Uh, I want to see oh, yellow beard. Mm -hmm. And it was Marty Allen's last movie. And he, he met Marty Allen on, on the set. And he was just playing like a Mexican policeman or whatever. And because of the way he was dressed, Allen really thought it was a real policeman. And also because of Sergio's heavy accent. He's yeah. like, hello, Mr. Mm -hmm. you know, Mr. Feldman. I am such a fan. I, uh, I am a policeman today. Well, I'm not really a policeman, but I'm in the movie. And the whole time he said, Marty was totally freaked out. And then sadly, the next day, Poor Marty Allen passed away, had a heart attack in his sleep. And uh, so Sergio, even in his DC solo uh, book of anthology of short stories, he's like the day I killed Marty Allen, Mar Marty yeah. Feldman. And we're like, oh, my God. And he's telling us the story. And all of us are just crying, laughing. And it's, you know, I forget. It's somebody at one point, like, everybody loves Raymond. Everyone's like, you know, everybody does love you, Sergio. And he's like, this yeah. is true. This is absolutely true. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, man. So no, no I get it. Every, every, everybody, I mean, there, there's a, there's actually a section in the book. Sergio is not just one of the main characters of the story. Um, but, um, you know, everyone had so much to say about Sergio, including people like Frank Miller and some of the bigger name folks that we got in on it. And so there's, I actually have a section in the book of just people basically sounding off on how much they love Sergio how influential they, he was to their career um, and also some really wild stories about, you know, he's done so many other things. He's not just a cartoonist, um, but he's a world traveler and a, apparently an, a, a, a dynamite chef. And I think it's Jim Valentino, I believe it was, who tells this really funny story about um, Sergio went to, I always mix it up where where you can go. Not it's either the Arctic or Antarctica. I can never remember which one you can go to. But anyway, Sergio somehow went to whichever pole you can actually go to. Hilarious. And Jim or whomever, I believe it was Jim Valentino, said something along the lines of Sergio just saw a posting on a billboard back in the day before the internet uh, that said they were looking for a chef for one of the facilities, and Sergio decided to go. And he said that's the kind of person Sergio was. And Stan Sakai and a number of other people all agree that if you ever are traveling around the world, you want to travel with Sergio Aragones because apparently he speaks all these different languages. He's so likable and he's so adaptable. And m many, many people brought that up is that like they either traveled with Sergio to go to different conventions around the world or whatnot, or just travel with him at a friendship or whatnot. And everyone said Sergio is the best travel mate and we'll get you out of any trouble. And he can handle anything that comes along and, you know, it will find the most fun adventures. So, and yeah, there, there he is. I mean, look at that guy. And by the way, that's, that's Sergio. That's Jack Katz. And that's Harvey Kurtzman. Yep. All together. Harvey Kurtzman of Matt, of course. And, you know, these are just some of the really fun pictures that I'm so excited about. And I want to say too, for people who are wondering those, those side images there, we had just an incredible designer that I told him, and we've become very good friends through this process. You can see those those uh, kind of archive things on the on the side there. Um, that's in the book, and the designer Jonathan Barley. And I told him I will continue doing this. I will keep mentioning his name because he just did such an incredible job. Um, look, I mean, if we don't win some awards for best design, uh, I don't know what, but you know, we, we worked together and he really put this together and, and, you know, that image of the paper clip there above the good doctor's head there, that's in the book. And then Jonathan Barley, who, who, who did the design, he really wanted it to look like it was kind of this old, you know, a series of archives and whatnot. So he did all this stuff with making it look like there's scotch tape for some of the pictures <laughs> and, and all those things. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So that's just actually in the book there, those, those kind of side designs. Um, or that kind of that fold right there, uh, yeah. you know, that's, that's part of it. It really is. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a cool, kind of a cool thing there. 
Uh, Warren uh, Drummond, a good Hollywood uh, storyboard artist and a San Diego regular, points out, oh, my God, Harvey, one of my teachers at the School of Visual Arts. And remind everybody, Matthew, it's only a couple of weeks. When When is the book coming out? Thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for that, Warren. I appreciate it. And thank you, John. I, I love how we're, we're letting people know about the book who didn't know about it beforehand. It's coming out September 6th uh, through Fanagraphics, of course. Um, and um, it should be in stores everywhere. Um, of course, you can get it. Um, I hate to, to, to promote Amazon because they're so terrible in every way, but we all have to play the game. So, you know, what can you do? So you can order it on Amazon. I will say if you do order it on Amazon, please uh, give us a review because the way that all those awful, horrible algorithms work is the more reviews you have, the more you get recommended. And this is absolutely, uh, as you can tell already in what we've been talking about, I mean, there's just no question. I've done a lot of books over the years, but this one is something really special. And the more people who know about it and are aware of it, the better I think, and not just because it's a great book and a lot of fun, and I'm really proud of it, but the, that these are the stories of the people who made this happen. And and folks like you, Warren, who are into Harvey Kurtzman and were taught by him and some of these other stories and whatnot, like they are in this book and wh if, whether they're photographed in the book or they're interviewed uh, in the book, people like Sergio and, and Scott Shaw and Frank Miller and Neil Gaiman and some of the others we've been talking about, it's their stories, you know, and that was something that was very important for me, both with the podcast and now with the book, is I'm not in it at all, um, you know, and, and I actually get very upset about this kind of thing, especially these days when we see this more and more, where you have people who put out books like this, these pop culture histories, which is really kind of my main passion, I've done books on the Nickelodeon, on the Simpsons and some of these other things, Yes, and, you know, all of geek culture through the lens of Comic-Con, but I did not want this to be let me tell you my story about going to Comic-Con. Let me tell you about when I used to go there as a kid. And let me tell you about things that I've seen or heard or bringing in all this stuff from Wikipedia or other article stuff. No, ah, that's not what this is. Not this, at all. This is a real resource. This is the raw stories from the people themselves with, uh, you know, obviously I'm, I'm well aware you can never be totally objective because every time you make any edit at all, you're making some choices. But A... You know, I had over 70 hours of material and B, I really became, and John, you know this, I really, and I have a tendency of doing this like with Mike Reese with the Simpsons book. I became very close with a lot of these people, many, many of them. And some of them I'm already all working on other projects with. And I talked to regularly right before I, I did this, John, um, and he, he sends his love, by the way, I was just talking with Scott Shaw um, and uh, just, just saying hi. I was returning a call and I said, Oh, I, I, I got to run. I'm, I'm doing John's show. And he said, Oh, send him, send him my love. He's such a pro. So oh, that's not Scott's big fan ears, John too. But the point is that I, I got close enough with these people and I've been helping them tell their story through the podcast and now the book um, that I'd like to think that the choices I did make for some of the editing and, and that kind of thing is really based on their consultation. And I was always making sure to call certain people and say, Hey, am I spelling this name right? And hey, one person said this, but another person said that. So I really, really did my due diligence here. And it's very important for me uh, to have this out there because unfortunately, as we've already talked about, some of these people are not going to be around much longer. Some of the people that, you know, stories are told about or, um, you know, pictures are not around anymore. Yeah. And even, you know, and, 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 I, and I'm happy always to plug his name because I know how important he was to the scene and, and hasn't gotten a lot of credit over the years. But Gene Henderson and his lovely wife, Mary, um, who was already gone but before I got into all this. But Gene, I was able to interview. And he, he told me during the interview he wouldn't be around to see this all come to fruition and unfortunately he was correct but i'm really glad that we were able to get not only stories about gene and mary henderson who were kind of the the, the mother and father hen of the scene in the early years a lot of people kind of refer to them as like the uncle and aunt because it was a lot of kids and then some a few older people like gene and mary uh helping out but gene was a big part of the scene and I'm so glad we were able to interview him and get his personal stories and stuff about his lovely wife, Mary, um, in the podcast and now in the book and pictures of him and the like. So it was really it's really important for me to make that very clear that this book is not my story. I, I, I've, I've, I've talked about it before. I almost wish I didn't have to put my name on it. I almost feel a little silly. You know, I, I really am more of a curator and editor of all these stories I got. Yes, I did the interviews and I certainly did a lot of work to get them all set up and whatnot, but it's their stories that I'm helping to tell. 
And I hope and believe that over the next few years, as this book gets out there more and more, um, that it will be used as that resource, especially when, unfortunately, a lot of these people won't be around much longer. So we need their stories now. And, and a lot, you know, yeah. And, and further, Matthew, it's not a puff piece because it yeah. really is the story warts and all because yeah, they're yeah. fighting mm -hmm. this group of people. They didn't always agree mm -hmm. on, on guests or whatever. And some people were on a power trip. Others, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of egos. Fighted, a lot, <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of egos. Yeah. And, uh, and like you said, I, I would I would describe you having listened to the podcast series that while we're waiting for that release, if you haven't listened to this, Comic-Con Begins, as Matthew said, available wherever you find podcasts. It's amazing. And it will really scratch the itch while you're waiting to get the <laughs> physical book. But uh, yeah. I would per, I would uh, suggest that you're like the reporter in Citizen Kane, who we never see, we only see the back of his head as he's talking to everybody, filling in the story of of Orson Welles' character. And and truly, I think you, I think you did stay out of these people's way. That is my only goal. Well, I, I appreciate that, interviews. John. I, I really appreciate that, John, and and I take that as a huge compliment because of everything that I've done with this. That's probably my my favorite aspect. Because really, it, it's it's all I'll say it, whether you want to call it philosophical or ideological that that's my take on it look i i occasionally will enjoy a good documentary or a good book um where the creator puts himself or herself into the story especially if it makes sense obviously like a lot of the comic-con people early on they talk about this too i'm a huge huge fan as are so many writers of our generation of hunter s thompson who's really one of the kings of that yeah. um I did a fantastic job of that. I mean, Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail 72 is one of my favorite books of all time. And, you, 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 I mean, that book couldn't be what it was if Hunter didn't put himself into the story. So I really appreciate that. Or, you know, even with some some documentaries over, over the last few years, yeah, many of them I don't really care for when there are these pop culture histories and so much of it's about the filmmaker talking about his or her, you know, experiences watching the movie they're talking about or the TV show or whatever you know, when they're younger, I think a lot of times that's filler, but when it's done right. And I think a really good example is that great documentary that came out a couple of years ago, best worst film about the behind the scenes uh, and the fandom that grew up over uh, the movie troll Two, um, which like so many people from our scene, I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of. Um, but I thought that was a really well done documentary, even though the filmmaker who happened to be, a main character in the film. So it made sense. He was talking about himself and his relationship to all these people that worked out really well. So it can be done. Um, you know, some Michael Moore movies, I don't like at all. Some of them I really like, I think Roger and me is a fantastic film. And another really good example of a guy who put himself in the movie. A lot of it's about that. That's the movies about is his story trying to track down uh, Roger Moore. So it can work. But, but personally, I just think that there's a little bit too many of those kinds of documentaries these days. I think it can be a lazy way of just using some filler. Oh, I got 30 minutes of some great material and some interviews with a few of these people, but how am I filling out the rest of it? So I'm just going to talk about myself and my friends and you know fans of the film or fans of the TV show we're talking about. I think that's really unfortunate when that keeps happening or books the same way. We have a book about Star Trek or something, and it's mostly about, you know, the writer talking about himself or herself and, and their opinion of this stuff. That's not what this is. You know, this is the raw information. And you talk about Citizen Kane, John, I appreciate it. You know, I'm not putting myself anywhere in the echelon of these people, but I liked what I was aspiring toward for this was Studs Terkel. Yes. Uh, Alan Lomax. I mean, you know, I like yes. to see myself like I was getting these field recordings or like what Studs Terkel, the, the greatest of the greats, is you know, and I love, I love his, I love his books. Yes, um, and his radio that, show. You got Matthew. Yeah, you got a. You, I was oh good. I'm glad you're aware of his radio show. Yeah, or you know, you know who's a big one, John. I don't remember if we talked about this before, and, and I'll bring this up just because I think people should check it out. They might be surprised talking about kind of like we were saying before about Scott Ackerman uh, or Riza. You know, having passions you might not think about, but uh, Glenn Gould, the great pianist. Um, one of the great pianists of all time. I don't know if you know, do you know about his BBC shows he did at the end of his life, John? 
was that the Desert Island uh, records or anything? I don't know about Glenn Gould. Tell me, please. Glenn Gould at the end of his life, and I actually it was one of the big inspirations for how we put Comic Con Begins together. And I actually had a few of my producers and some of the editors and things that worked with me over at Sirius listen to them, and they completely got what I meant. Even though this was way more extreme, it's again it was almost like an art project of sorts. But Glenn Gould at the end of his life for the BBC uh, in the late seventies recorded um uh, an amish community and recorded um i think some of the, the the villagers and things in an area in saskatchewan that he lived in he was in canada at the end sure. and it really is this immersive soundscape of people talking and the church bells and the wind and it's in and you can tell as a musician he almost put it together like it was ambient music but he edited it in such a way that it really puts you there and again i I, I made sure my producers at Sirius listened to it before we started putting Comic-Con Begins together. And I was like, I want it like this. I want Live. people to feel like they're not just listening to the interviews, but especially with some of the archival stuff we have, that they're really there. And yes. everyone immediately said, A, we completely get what you mean. This is great. And B, we can't go that extreme with it because if you do listen to the, the, the Glenn Gould stuff, it is almost kind of like a soundscape. It's sort of like, like music. I'm with you. Different voices and things. And so I highly, highly recommend them. I think he did at least two. He might have done three. I can't remember what they're called. Um, thank you, Erwin. I, I see your quote there. Um, but that was a big inspiration. And again, it was because you didn't hear Glenn Gould. I don't recall if you heard even any interviewers or anything. It was just people talking and church bells and the cows and the wind. And just you, you're just you can close your eyes. And it's like a, a synesthetic experience. You're just there. And Glenn Gould, one of the great pianists of all time, uh, produced it for BBC. And it's a really interesting thing. Yeah, I would highly, highly recommend it. I think you can even hear them on Spotify or whatever. But okay. that was a big inspiration for us, as was Studs Terkel and some of these others. I really had, wanted to be had, as hard as possible. Yeah. Had the pleasure of interviewing Studs a couple times in Chicago right. radio. Oh, yeah, you're and, being and, and, yeah. and yeah, and told him how much he meant to me as an interviewer. And uh, no, I get what you're saying, man. And also, it's funny, when you see Glenn Gould, I was like thinking of John Peel, the wonderful sure. BBC yeah. interviewer. And and yeah. uh, truly, and, and forgive yeah. me, everybody, I because I don't mean this, again, as Matt's saying, I don't want it to be about me. But one of the greatest uh, compliments I've received over the years is like, Oh, you're like the John Peel of comics. Yeah. And it's like, wow. Uh, thank you. Good Lord. You certainly interviewed probably as many people, if not more. So I'm closing yeah, in okay. on 2000. Episode. Yeah. And, and by the way, I'm uh, going to throw it out there just because I love doing this when I can. It, for people who don't know who John Peel is, if nothing else, if you ever see the phrase P the Peel sessions on any record, because they actually, he's so important and he was so good, not just as an interviewer, but also just to have all these different great people on his shows. Brian Jones, Tom Masker, PJ Harvey, so many different. I I have like like if you ever see the Peel session for any of your favorite bands, get that record because that stuff is so good. Because he the producers he would use and everything, it would be really raw. And sometimes you would hear some of the interviews and just people talking to him also. But yeah, John Peel is is another one. He's a great example of just a hero of mine. And I get I get Peel sessions versions of so many of my favorite rock bands. Yeah, um, because he's he's so good. And, and again, it's the entire experience of even when I hear the music, it's just recorded really well and it's produced really well. It still has that live authentic in the studio radio yes. studio feel, but it's very, very clean also, which is really nice to get sometimes. So I highly recommend anything from John Peel um, and, and some of the stuff they've released literally over the years because he's so good at what he does. So Matt, Matthew, I know it's like 10 year time. Are we up against the clock? I don't want to, I don't want to. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, um, I just, just uh, so I can, I can get, get some rest here and such soon. I have a few other yeah, things man. before bed. Um, you know, why, why don't we, why don't we hang for a little longer? Maybe a okay. little, five, 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. I don't want to, okay. I'm, I'm because, having a good time on here as always, John. I love talking. No, and I, dude, you know, um, it, and so, I, uh, yeah. well, I always appreciate your time, but yeah. Um, so let's, yeah let's, like, let's give so, another five, 10 minutes and then. Uh, okay. Kind of well, we could even say, obviously then to pro promote the book, as you said earlier, you're going on a city by city tour I am. where yeah. you'll have comic creators with you I will. Uh, and, and also former Comic-Con uh, organizers in their mm -hmm. towns as well. Mm -hmm. And you're, and you're showing movies in some, some cases, yeah. which I think is we're, we're doing, we're doing all different kinds of things uh, for people who are familiar with me and my career. They know that this is one of the things I love to do. 
And again, it's it's become unfortunately and very sadly to me. It's one of the reasons I like to keep doing it, even with you know I'll, I'll just say it sometimes. Some some publishers uh, sometimes discourage me from it because in some ways it's it can be considered uh, to a lot of people a waste of time, certainly a waste of money. Um, in this case, as with most cases, I'm putting all on the credit card. So, you know, what can you do? Um, but um, for me, it's not so much about selling books because you, know, you, you unfortunately don't sell a lot of books on these tours anymore unless you're, you know, Stephen King or someone like that. Um, but for me, it's about two things. One is, you know, I, I do want to help promote the book. So it's a great way to get um, local media in these different places that I go to. Um, so, you know, for me, that's the capitalist in me and the marketing guy and putting on the marketing hat and the publicist hat um, of, yeah, I, if I go to these different places, um, especially places where I've lived, places where I've, I've been involved in the media, I have bounced all over the country over the years, always working for local media and TV stations, radio. So I know people in all these different places I'm going to who can get me in the local paper or get me on the local radio station or whatever it is. Some of these places, it's the local NPR affiliate or whatnot. So that for me, that's that's a good practical reason to do it. Um, on a personal level, though, yeah, I love meeting people and I love talking with them. Look, you know, there's no getting around it. When you're a writer, when you're putting together a project like this, I'm spending a lot of time by myself. And although, you know, I'm interviewing people and I'm talking with them on the phone and over Zoom like this, you know, I'm basically by myself, especially the last couple of years where it was COVID and whatnot. Um, and especially when we were putting a lot of this project together, it was literally the the, <laughs> the rise and fall of COVID. So this is a way for me to really get out there and meet the fans. And many of the people that are going to be on the tour with me in these different stops are people that I've interviewed or even have known over the last few years that I've actually never met in person. Um, and so it'll be great just to see them. So, um, yeah, I think I think some of the really exciting ones along the way, you, you can find out more about it on my website. That's MatthewClickstein.com. As it's spelled here, it really is spelled with one T. That's not just an affectation ah. of me being a diva. It's on my birth certificate. That's how my name is spelled. Um, but if you go to MatthewClickstein.com, you'll see the full tour. Um, and uh, we'll be starting up September 8th in L.A. Uh, it's going to be really exciting. Um, we're going to be doing Skylight Books um, uh, in, in, in L.A. in Los Feliz area. It's the largest independent bookseller in L.A. We're doing a signing there. Then we're going right up the street to the Los Feliz Theater uh, that, that yeah. the Cinematech now has. We're going to be showing Scott Pilgrim versus the World, one of the great gate culture films of all time. And then having a panel afterwards with Scott Shaw, who is you know one of the creators of Comic-Con. Uh, people consider him the mayor of Comic-Con. Really great guy, of course, has done all of his own uh, animation stuff and comic books and things over the years as well. Um, he's even actually uh, drawing, as we speak, um, a, a piece of artwork that they're going to be using to help promote it and will be um, projected on the wall during the panel. And for those who really love his work, they will be auctioning off the original as well. Wow. Um, yeah. And so, and, and Scott, by the way, I'm going to give him credit here for this. He's doing it all for free. So it's really nice of him. Um, but Scott Shaw will be there. Um, and Wendy All, who a lot of people might not know her name, but she was another one of the people who helped to, to really get Comic Con going in the early one of the days. Organizers, also, yeah. yeah, became became really big in the toy design world. She worked for Mattel and a lot of the other companies like that. Um, and uh, Paul M. Salmon, who was one of the people who helped to bring Hollywood down in the early days, he wrote the book on Blade Runner, which has never been out of print, amongst many other things. And a number of other folks that are going to be there. Who are involved in Comic Con, involved in the comic book and 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 sci-fi and and geek culture scene? It's going to be hosted by my good friend Alan Salkin, um, who writes for Los Angeles Magazine. Vanity Fair. Uh, he's featured prominently right now um, on the the docu series Bad Vegan on Netflix, uh, actually based on his cover story for Vanity Fair. Um, but we're doing that. And then I'm going right up uh, the next day to San Francisco for the Cartoon Museum, where we'll be doing an event with uh, the great Trina Robbins. Who's Absolutely. Also and for people who don't know, although you should, especially if you're listening and watching this, uh, Trina is very important to the scene. Not only was she, is she another one who's always been at Comic-Con over the years, but she is really the first feminist uh, uh, co uh, underground comics person ever. She always likes to say, people will call her one of the first, but she always says, no, 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 I'm the first. She's and, adorable. Uh, yeah. She is so and, great. 
Trina's amazing. She also, she's just one of those people. I just finished her book, actually, by the way, also out from Fantagraphics. Last Girl Standing just came out a couple of years ago. I highly recommend yep. it. She has so many amazing stories about doing stuff with fashion and rock and roll people. She is literally the Trina that Joni Mitchell is singing about in Ladies in the Canyon. You can hear it's the lyric of the song, and that's Tr that's our Trina, Trina that's, Robbins. That's um, the thing, man. All these people are like, hey, all with the, all yes, connected. the hipsters of the moment yeah, yeah. and and comics was always there and that's yeah. what i love and i love as you do these great uh movie documentaries about 70s cinema 70s yeah. music and all that stuff and it's like people will forget and thankfully because of your book they won't forget because comics was right there it it, 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 it absolutely it absolutely was and and all the, and we 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 have everybody talking about it. in fact it's a big part of what the second episode of the podcast and the second chapter of the book is about is I'll just say it it's about the sex drugs and rock and roll damn straight of, of the scene because you know and and I always tell people when they go oh I didn't think about that before and I go these were teenagers in the sixties and seventies what do you think they were doing in Southern California of course they were completely inspired and influenced by that and they were all hanging out with and bringing down people from San Francisco who were doing all the underground comic stuff and whatnot. And those were their heroes. They tried to get Hunter S. Thompson to come out one year. They had Dr. Timothy Leary there. George Clinton Johnson was stoned the entire time. They had all exactly. these rock and roll people there and hanging out with them and whatnot. I mean, it was all interconnected. And as you said, Absolutely. even earlier in the, in the show here, John, that people do tend to forget that comics and science fiction alike, and even just geek culture in general, a lot of animation and all that kind of stuff was very much a part of and inspired by the counterculture. Absolutely. I mean, uh, it really, it really, really was. You it cover, really was. you cover the sky pirates. Thank you. Yeah, the air yeah, pirates, yeah, yeah. which no, is, fair. if you don't know everybody, you got to get the book, but also uh, basically a, a Mickey mouse, Disney mm -hmm. uh, underground comic, uh, Not by Disney. Disney. Disney actually ended up suing them. So well, that's Disney what I no no I'm it, saying an yeah. underground parody was, of, was a bunch of Mickey Mouse and Disney. Yeah, and and became it, yeah. very controversial because Disney did not like being no. parodied and no. wonderful photographs of uh fundraising for the defense fund. Yeah, no, they they literally it was a bunch of you know stoner artists like Dan O'Neill and Terry Flanagan and Bobby London and some of these others who had been doing this stuff and they're getting sued by Disney and they, they're, they're kids who were just doing these underground comics, making fun of Mickey mouse and Minnie mouse and Donald duck cussing and doing drugs and fucking and everything else. Exactly. And Disney brought the hammer down hard. And from what I understand, um, there's still a lot of bad blood amongst some of those folks that are still around because it's something they really never got over. It really Dude. kind of, was was it was it was very impactful negatively in their lives, and a lot of people were very upset that 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 happened. Yeah, yes. lesson: don't fuck with the mouse. Don't fuck mouse, with the mouse. The yeah. mouse has serious teeth. Rabies, no, they were then and he's now. happy to bite you. No, they really came after them. But it shows that even a large entity like Disney, even back at the earliest stages of underground comics, Disney didn't just let it go. They really came after it because they were that worried. I mean, it really was to them. A big, a big deal. It was it's a big, their brand. Yeah, and, it was. A, yeah. It was so, but I mean, the fact that they didn't just let it go and say, "Oh, it's just a bunch of kids." Bunch of kids. Who cares? Yeah. They were like, "No, we need to do something." Because I think that, and and it says something to the power of the Air Pirates and Underground Comics that they said we need yes. to put a kibosh on this. These, this and is dangerous. Really them. This, this, and, is, and, this is literally dangerous stuff, uh, you know. And so Disney and, came after them. And yeah. and truly, man, we need to wear this shit as a badge of honor, that's and true. that's why uh, this book is so important and deserving of uh everyone's attention here i gotta bring no, it up. i i really i really appreciate it and, and that is a big part of the story that i almost wish we can kind of get out there more even in the marketing and promotion and such because i i think one of mine and i and i hate to go a little negative here but one of my again i don't want to say regrets or, or 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 whatnot about this but you know i think i i worry that a lot of people will think and, and anyone listening to this or watching it or, and some of the people have already been so helpful Please tell your friends, tell your students, if you're a teacher or anything else, not only about it, but that it's much more than just about Comic-Con. And it's much more than just about San Diego. And it's much more than just about comics, as Comic-Con itself is. It's about the entire community 
that helped make this happen. It really is. And we go all the way back to the 1930s. We go back before Comic-Con, well before right. Comic-Con, to at least Worldcon in 1939, which a lot of people would agree is probably the first real kind of mainstream or whatever you want to put it, you know, professional convention. that When happened. Julie Schwartz and Mort Weisinger and yeah, Forey Ackerman were, were, were yeah. kids yeah. and fans of science. Yeah, abs abs absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, you had those people there and, and, and a young guy named Ken Kruger, who would later on create a, a bookstore in San Diego that would sell comic books, science fiction books, and adult books to make money. <laughs> and that was where all the Comic-Con kids hung out um, before they actually put Comic-Con together. It was basically their version of CBGB. Um, and although we didn't get Ken yes. in the past, we do have Ken's son, Gus, who's a great guy. Um, and he'll also be, by the way, at the panel in LA. He's another one. Oh, great. Yeah, Gu Gus is fantastic. Um, but, um, you know, this, this is about... All of these different things. We we chose Comic Con because I'm not just saying it. It's been clocked twice by Guinness. It is the largest uh, pop culture gathering worldwide, and so we use that as kind of the lens to go into all these different stories and all these different people, um, and so much of what's happened over the last century about how the geeks have inherited the earth and how science fiction and comic books and cartoons and all these things have gone from you got beat up for it or you got ah. off on your paper from your, you know, people forget even the teachers would say, you can't do, you know, a paper on Martian Chronicles. You can't read Lord right, of the Rings in this class, trash. you know, get out of my classroom. Yeah, it's trash. And so now it's the exact opposite. Now they have classes at Harvard on this stuff and now everything is geek culture and whatnot. So it's that story but we did it through the lens of Comic-Con. Otherwise, it would be, you know, a 50,000-page book rather than a 500-page book. So I will say that please understand and please, you know, tell your friends, anyone who wants to help us get the word out, that, that this is about the entire scene, the entire community. And a lot of that, because the, the, a lot of this happened in the 60s and 70s, involves a lot of that really cool, interesting counterculture stuff. And we have stories of people coming right from Vietnam you know, fighting in the war and whatever it is after being drafted and hating it and being all screwed up by the war and coming coming back to America. And one of the first things they did was go to Comic-Con. I mean, people talking about literally going in their fatigues and whatnot or, you know, getting a day pass and, you know, going to Comic-Con for five sure. years and, you know, getting sent in the brig or whatever because they, were, they, they weren't supposed to. Went up. I mean, that was going on and Nixon and Watergate and all these things were happening while these kids were doing this. So, of course, they were impacted by it. Of course, they were affected. Now, we talked about Mark Evanier earlier, and this is part of what I like about oral history. Some people might disagree with that, like Mark and a few others who would say, no, 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 Comic-Con and reading comic books and science fiction was all about getting away from all that stuff, which, hey, you know what? If that was their experience, great. And we have sure. those stories in the book, too. But, you know, you look at a few of the pictures and most of the stories of the over 50 people we talked to and it was drug, sex, and rock and roll. And yeah. dealing with what was going on with the political stuff in the scene for, I would say, a fair majority of the people who were involved in all this. So, you know, that's an important part of the story and something I'm very excited about. Even down to, I will say, <clears throat> and Wendy All again, and a few others were some of the people who said this, you know, they were looking around the country and seeing what kids their own age or only a few years older were doing with Woodstock and with stuff yes. going on in Washington, D.C., and just, you know, up north 500 miles to Berkeley and San Francisco with the free speech movement and everything. And they were saying, if those kids can do that, what can we do down here? And so they were inspired by a lot of that to put something like Comic-Con together. So these things were all very interconnected. The politics, the rock and roll, the pill, the sex, the drugs, all of the craziness. And it goes both ways. You know, I'm, I'm probably not the first person to say this. And these people in the book aren't the first people. Even people who weren't doing drugs like Kirby and like some of the others, you know, people were saying like, they look like they were from their work. And when you're looking, you know, even someone like Steve Ditko, who was as far from being a stoner and a drug person as possible, but you're looking at some of the artwork he's doing and people were saying, wow, these guys look like they were on acid. Yeah, clearly he's artwork. tripping while he's doing yeah, Ken exactly. Ironwood, the great Eclipse yeah. uh, uh, editor uh, said that. And, and, you know, Ditko was so offended I mean, one of the greatest. Yeah, they were the ones who like didn't want Timothy Leary and stuff there, yep. 
but their work looked like it simply because it was ca capturing the zeitgeist of that time. Absolutely. And they might not have even understood. And there are stories in the book where, where the kids would be hanging out with people like Ditko and, and Kirby and some of these others. And they'd be looking at, you know, Victor Moskosko's work or some of the underground guys work. And, and, and Kirby and some of these guys would be going, wow, uh, how did they come up with these ideas? Where is this all coming from? And the kids would kind of be snickering going like, they didn't even know them. they're all stoned the whole time. All, so all like, of Kirby's. It's, just, it's the artwork that's there. Yeah. At both DC and Marvel, Kirby's cosmic output, so influenced by the moment, filmmakers, underground comics. Um, I love all of Kirby's um collage kind of yeah, efforts absolutely. that he and would then, also incorporate just, in comics. I mean, when you think of the idea of the Kirby crackle, I mean it's like you're literally looking, I mean, talk about synthesia again, you're looking at you know the uh, at sound and movement drawn into something. Oh, thank you very much, Peter. I really yeah, Peter's really excited. psyched uh, yeah. by the book. <laughs> nice on Peter. Matt and I talking tonight. Yeah, but 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 the point of all that is, so even the people who weren't, you know, directly involved in or impacted by the sex, drugs, rock and roll, it, it still was getting into their consciousness and, yeah. and helping to inform their artwork. And by the way, again, going the other way too, where a lot of that stuff was inspired by these kids who, before they were doing the drugs and the rock and roll stuff, were reading, you know, your Kirby's and some of these other guys. And so it inspired them when they were doing the rock posters later or when they were doing the album covers and so forth for all these different bands, the Grateful Deads and, you know, Janis Joplin and all these other people and whatnot. Um, and, you know, so it's it, it all was this give and take. And that's what the story is about. And that's what the podcast is about, Comic-Con Begins. And that's what the book is about, See You at San Diego. Um, is about all of these, it's the connection and the sharing of ideas and the sharing of passions and everything. Science fiction, animation, movies, underground comics, underground films, martial arts, magic, all of it, you know, fantasy stuff, cosplay, it's all in here. And we talk to all the people who made it all happen. Any kind of fandom that you're into there's probably either a representative from that world in there uh, in the book or they're talked about or there's pictures of it or them. And that's what I'm really proud of. And that's what it is we've put together. So A, get the book, please. You can pre-order it now. It's out September 6th. B, put up some reviews for me on Amazon, please, when you do, so we can get the that awful recommendation algorithm to let other people know about it. And C, tell your friends and family and and students, if you're a teacher, especially, I hope that younger people get to read this and better understand it. There's a there's an I missing from Steam. Steam. Okay, because I was doing it from I, your, uh, uh, your your little sign in there, man. Yeah. Oh, that's that's my fault. I'm sorry. No, I'm no, just, no. I'm doing it right you know now. I, no, it's hey, 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 by the way, everyone, I'm just gonna say it right now. I'm such a working class uh, creative here that the I on my laptop doesn't work very well. Oh, my dash yeah, doesn't work. Actually, it's what it is. It's E I N. Damn it. All right, hang on. Close Sorry, everybody. I'm doing it wrong. Yeah, literally, the eye on my laptop doesn't really work, and I'm too poor to get a new one and get it fixed. Well, let's, that's what we got to sell some books yeah, for you. Well, but the uh, point is, like, happen, I really, I, you know, I want to get the story out. There we go. I want to get the story out, the stories, and I want to get these people the spotlight they deserve because everyone should know who Scott Shaw is. Yes. Everyone should know who B. Joe Trimble is. Yes. Everyone should know who, who Brink Stevens is. I'm sure a lot of people do who are into this, of course. Um, and Dorf, you know, yeah. uh, Dave, David Clark. I mean, yeah. all these wonderful people. Yeah, whose name's Roger Friedman. I mean, Roger. people whose names you might not be yes. familiar with, but people who you should know their names. You should know everything that they did to put this all together. They're not going to be around much longer. And I'm so proud to be able to help not only get their stories out there of how they helped to make all this happen, even if you don't know their names already, but also to give them the spotlight that they deserve. And there's some really cool pictures of these people in there. So thank you so much, everybody for listening and watching. Thank you, John, for having me on this show. I will say this is actually the first you, you got me first. Um, uh, uh, Fanographics was able to get something in io9 a couple weeks ago for Comic Con, an excerpt from the book. But this is this is my first real interview for this Wonderful. book. So you got number one, John. Thank you for doing it. I'm so glad I was able to do it on your show. And everyone, please check out the book. Tell your friends and family and students about it. We need to get this out there. It, and, and trust me, royalty schemes these days suck. I love Fanographics. I love Gary. I love all that stuff. But the reality is, books don't make money anymore. They just don't. So I probably will never see a penny on this thing. 
I'm, I'm doing this as a labor of love. I would have done it for free. I would have paid for it if I could have. I love these people that are in the book. I love the, the story. They're my people. They're my forebears. Let's all help to do everything we can to get this out there because it, it's not putting money in my pocket. I can tell you that. But it is going to help get these folks the attention they deserve, the spotlight they deserve. And let's get it for them before some of them aren't around much longer. And that's I really mean that from my heart. That's what a lot of this is about, especially some of the folks, many of them that I've become extremely close to and want to see them in their last few years here get some of the spotlight that they deserve because they all really did so much for all of us to, to make the world what it is now with geek culture and pop culture the way that it is. So let's help them get their attention that they deserve and, and awards and hopefully they get work out of this. I keep telling them, you know, you know, cause a lot of them are still working and they're still struggling to do stuff well into their seventies and eighties. Let's sure. get them attention so that Hollywood will come calling and saying, Hey, Scott Shaw, we want you to do animation for our new movie. He should be doing animation for hundred percent. So, you know, that's, that's, that's what I hope that this does. I really do. That's, that's where I'm coming from for this. And if I get five bucks out of this too, hooray. But, you know, this is about getting these stories out there and we, we need it out there. So please, everyone, help us out. Get the word out. I'm, I'm begging you here. That do what you can. The title is See You at San Diego from Fantagraphic Books. It comes out on September 8th. Matthew is going to be on a massive countrywide tour. Go to MatthewClickstein.com. That's Matthew with one T. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, check out the schedule because not only Matthew, but a lot of great comic creators. And yeah, we got Tim Seeley is going to be at one. We got Hoche Anderson up where I'm going to be actually in Toronto. Um, we got all different kinds of folks. Um, I'm, I'm doing CXC in Columbus with Jeff. Smith. Yes. Um, so, you know, in Columbus. So yeah, everywhere I'm going, um, uh, we're, uh, Barry Alfonso, who's another one that a lot of people might not know his name, but he's one of the co-founders of Comic-Con going to Pittsburgh for him. Um, at Phantom of the Attic. So yeah, you can go to my website. It is E-I-N. I'm sorry, I misspelled it because my laptop sucks because I'm poor. Um, but um, uh, the point is you can see that uh, on my website and yeah, come on by and, you, and you'll get a chance to meet these people. And by the way, they are all as cool as you would hope and think that they are. So if you come to our thing in LA or you come to our thing in Pittsburgh or Toronto or Seattle, we're doing a thing in Seattle, obviously at the Fanographic store where people like Greg Bear and Astrid Anderson will be and a few others. Wonderful. And they're really cool people and you know, they'll probably end up, you know, talking with you and, and, and shaking your hand and everything else. So if you want to meet some of these people, they will be at all these different things. Trina Robbins at the cartoon museum. She's such a lovely person. Let's go. So come on out because we're, we're going to have special things all the way. I'm even open to still put some stuff together. And by the way, if you're listening to this and watching this and you want me to come to your town, I don't have any money, but if you can help me get there and you can, you know, uh, you know, get something going at a store and, and whatever, you know, like, let's do it. I'm happy to go to some other places. Uh, so a lot I'm of store sure owners that. listen yeah. to Word Balloon, MatthewClickstein.com. Yeah, yeah. Get in touch with Matthew because, it. yeah, if you, you know, and I know you fly in creators yeah, all yeah, the time. I'll, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm putting as much of it on the credit card as possible, but if folks can help me to get out. And I would still, there are places I'd still love to go, like Baltimore and Atlanta, a lot of the East Coast stuff that we haven't had a chance for yet, maybe in the spring. But, uh, you know, if, if you want me to come to your town, Austin would be great. And a few of these other places, I, I would love to come out and, you know, just let me know uh, or let John know and he'll let me know. But I'm, yeah. I'm happy to add to the tour. And, you know, we're, I'm, I am still talking with a few other organizations and things about maybe doing that. Colleges, I'm doing some, some talking at some different colleges, museums. So whatever, I'm even doing some record stores and stuff like that. Cause again, there's a lot to do with the music. Yes. Scene. So if you, if you have a place near you or you run the place or own a place and want me to come out, let's talk. I'm happy to try to make it work. Well done, Matthew, as always, Matthew, seriously, you know, ever since we've met, you've been an incredible help to me, yeah. connecting me with people. You just connected me with Mike Reese, yeah. uh, your wonderful uh, co collaborator on Sims, uh, Springfield confidential. And uh, that episode is coming out in the next couple of days. And uh, yeah, man, thank you for, for everything you do for me. So I'm, I'm always happy to help promote. And in fact, once this gets going, and it was great to hear that Scott, you know, uh, is is happy with me and wants to talk to me again. I I have a feeling I will even be reaching out to various sure. of my friends who I know will be part of the tour to help right. promote the book. And, and mm -hmm. also, it's a good excuse to uh, get them on and have a great uh, geek conversation like Absolutely. we always do. Absolutely. So thanks, man. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Everybody, fanographics.com, and uh, you can go there to order the book online through them. You can also order through Amazon. Hopefully, a lot of your local shops are getting it, and maybe shows like this will make people aware and uh, get them to order the book for your store as well. 
But uh, here, I'm going to show the cover one last time. And it's See You at San Diego, the oral history of uh, Comic-Con fandom, and finish the title for the me. The triumph of geek culture. Indeed. We won. We, <laughs> we won, won the war, everybody. Won, won the geeks Absolutely. Won. So, right, uh, seriously, Matthew, go to bed. And uh, good yeah. luck with the tour. All and right. stay in touch, and we'll talk soon. Okay. All right. Thanks, Bye-bye. man. Thank you. Matthew Clickstein, everybody. You know, I'll tell you what. I'll even uh, share with you to, to wrap up the show a couple of my favorite uh, Comic-Con memories. And I know, I know I've done it before. But uh, I first of all, Brian Pesane, um 2006, I did my first uh, 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 pod, or podcast panel at San Diego. I wasn't the, um, the guy who put it all together initially, but my buddies at iFanboy, Scott Hines from Fanboy Radio, Augie DeBleek uh, from uh, Pipeline Comics, my buddy Chris Marshall from Co- Collected Comics Library, Lenny Taylor, I Read Comics, uh, the Indie Spinner Rack with Charlito and Mr. Phil. A lot of these first wave of comic podcasters, we all had our big panel. And I'm looking at the audience while we're talking, and I look, and there's this giant geek, kind of balding. He's got glasses on. He's got a Gillian hat. And I'm like, that's Brian Posehn. That's got to be Brian Posehn. So uh, I'm like, I'm thrilled. I'm like, it's Thursday, and he can see a million panels. And Brian comes to our podcast panel, and I'm like, this is amazing. And it's 2006, very early in, you know, the the formation of comics. I only started in 2005. Uh, Adam Curry only started a year earlier in 2004. So the podfather, as we all call him. And uh, so um, Saturday or Sunday of Comic-Con, I'm in the, the front section, not the main room, but the lobby that stretches throughout every entrance and stuff. And I'm walking around, and I see Brian Pusain. And I go, Brian, hey. And all of a sudden, he's got a, a like kind of bodyguard handler. And then he goes, hey, back off. And I'm like, you know, just relax. I'm saying hello. And and even Pasein is like, hey, calm down to the guy. And he's like, I'm sorry, man. What's up? And I'm like, well, I just wanted to thank you for coming to our first podcast panel on Thursday. You know, we're brand new and we're nobodies. And you're, you know, big time comedian. And then so much. And he's like, uh, yeah, OK, uh, sure. And I'm like, all right, maybe I was wrong. I don't know. So literally jumped to four years later, and I'm uh, in front of the Omni waiting for my for waiting for Brian Bendis, and I run into Rick Remender, Jerry Duggan, and Brian Posehn because they did a bunch of great uh, comics together well before Rick and Jerry and Brian, for that matter, all became Marvel writers because, you know, Brian and Jerry wrote Deadpool. Jerry continues to write wonderful comics for Marvel. Ricky had his great run at uh, Marvel, and then obviously he's kicking ass with all his creator own books. So, and I at this point know Rick really well. So he introduces me to Jerry and Brian, and we're talking, and it couldn't be nicer. And finally, like, Brian, I got to ask you. And I said, I know you're not going to remember this because it was such a blip. But I tell him about back in 2006 that I'm like, uh, I could have sworn it was you in the audience. He's like, Yeah. And I'm like, And apparently it wasn't. And he goes, yeah, I don't remember seeing that. I'm like, all right. He, he goes, yeah, dude, you'd be surprised. There's a ton of nerds that look exactly like me. So I don't know what happened in the gene pool, but apparently there are dozens of Brian Posehn's walking around. They're like, uh, oh, God, Alice the Goon and, and all the different goons on Goon Island and Popeye. It's like apparently there are there are legions of atomic supermen, as Bella Lugosi would say, that are all shaped like Brian Posehn. So be warned. They're out there. They're looking for you. So there was that, or even as Matthew had said, the difficulty about getting hotels and stuff. 2010, Bendis is like, well, you're coming, obviously, to San Diego. I want you to moderate the panel. I'm like, all right. And then Catherine and Stuart Immerman, who I'd gotten to know, God, I love them. And I really miss them. I haven't seen them or talked to them forever. But they're like, hey, if you're coming to uh, San Diego, we'd love, we'd love for you to moderate the panel. And I'm like, okay. And I wasn't planning on going. And then finally, John Hickman is like, hey, man, if you're uh, going to San Diego, I'd love for you to moderate my panel. I'm like, all right, fuck. That's three A-list panels that I could be hosting. I guess I'm going to San Diego. Thank God I had the full-time radio job at the time and even actually borrowed money to to finance the trip. Well, I didn't stay at one of the gas lamp hotels. There was no fucking way. And this is June. And literally, it's like, all right, I'm a, I've got about five weeks before – uh, from before San Diego, I got to make this happen because it's too great of an opportunity. It's early enough in Word Balloon's time that I felt necessary to to make all this work. So I end up staying in one of the San Diego suburbs at this Motel 6 
that is right near all the military bases. Because obviously San Diego, Port Town, lots of military, you know, a lot of, lot of military people. We love our military. Uh, so anyway, I, uh, I make this arrangement. And this Motel 6 is the grungiest Motel 6 you've ever been in. Tom Bodet had no idea about this Motel 6 when he used to do the nice commercials. Clean and comfortable room. Now, this thing, like, I mean, like the curtains had film on it. Like, it was definitely a hotel that didn't care about smoking, even though it was 2010. So I had not only sweats uh, and socks that I'd wear to bed, I put my hoodie on. I mean, my face was exposed, but I'm like, I am not letting my skin. Uh, it's going to touch as little bit of this hotel as possible. And the only food options that were directly nearby were uh, an AM PM gas station mini mart and a Jack in the box. And a lot of times just to stay, you know, because again, I wasn't planning on this trip, but I, and I did it on a shoestring. I'm eating almost every night at Jack in the box. And I guarantee you, I would stand in line waiting for my chance to, you know, give my order and I'm certain I was in line with a bunch of the prostitutes that were working the military bases based on what they were wearing. They couldn't have just been, you know, trying to be provocative to get a free date. I, I have a feeling they were doing business. So it's it's great. And as um, uh, Matt Besser had said earlier that, uh, uh, you know, great stories from San Diego. That's the thing, man. These cons, you always have great stories. I have great stories from C2E2 and uh, Terrific Con that I just did this last couple of weeks. You can hear my voice giving, so I'm going to wrap up. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, everybody. I really appreciate you listening. Take care. We'll talk tomorrow night with you. <coughs> oh, sorry, live coughing. Shelly Bond join, joining me tomorrow night here on Word Balloon Live. Until then, bye-bye.